of our previous lesson and we on gaseous exchange and how the, we are studying we are seeing how living organisms do obtain their respiratory gases and with respiratory gases i mean <coughs> the carbon dioxide and the oxygen and we are specifically on plants where we saw that plants do carry out gas exchange through the openings in the leaves called stomata and we agreed that the stoma the opening and closure of the stoma must be regulated and so we are on theories that try to explain how the stoma is opened and closed and we started with a photosynthetic theory where we saw what it is and how it is regulated or how it is affected then we talked about the starch sugar interconversion theory also we saw how this one controls the opening and closure of the stoma and if you want to revise more if you want to check more you can go and watch our previous video it is there you can watch it more and more and more until yeah you feel like yeah <clears throat> so now with the potassium pumps now if you remember when we were studying coordination we talked about the blue light receptors the blue light receptors okay they are found somewhere here in the guard cells okay now these ones they respond or they receive light in that way of length okay they receive blue light so now when these receptors receive the blue light they undergo they undergo configurational changes okay that will lead to opening of the potassium pumps okay so as a result you pump in potassium ions in the guard cells and obviously hydrogen ions will be pumped out so the pumping of potassium ions inside the guard cell lowers the water potential of the guard cells and increase <coughs> the osmotic uptake of, of, of the water uptake of these guard cells so as a result water enters into the guard cells from the neighboring epidermal cells and so if water enters like what we discussed the other time the guard the the, the, the cell virtues of these guard cells they will keep expanding expanding until when they attach onto the cell walls and due to irregular thickening like how we agreed about the previous lesson we agreed that the outer wall is thin and elastic whereas the inner walls these two walls they are thick and elastic and so what does that imply it implies that the inner walls will resist expansion whereas the outer walls they will, res they will expand creating tension on the inner walls hence inner walls drawing apart like how you can see hence opening the stoma now closure of this stoma it is under the influence of abscisic acid okay this is a plant hormone you remember when we studied plant hormones so it is the one which induces the closure of this stoma by activating reversal reactions so uh, otherwise like i told you you face a dilemma because at high rate intensity you have high rate of photosynthesis so that means the need for carbon dioxide is high so high okay but also the rate of transpiration is high the rate at which you are losing water is high so you face a dilemma but when you reach a given <coughs> rate of transpiration then you'll be forced to cross this stoma and so you produce you secrete this abscisic acid that will induce 
the closure of that stone. Not so? Yes, like always if you have a question that is immediate, that requires immediate intervention or immediate attention, then it's okay. You can unmute and ask for th that question. Or if the question doesn't require immediate attention, then you can drop it in the chat box, I'll find it. That's brilliant. So, adaptations of plants to gas exchange, we can brainstorm about some. Uh -huh, you can go in the chat box and drop some. What are the adaptations of plants eh, to effectively carry out gas exchange? You can drop some, and when you are th thinking about these adaptations, don't be limited to only leaves. Yes, leaves, yes, they do carry out transpiration in plants, actually, the largest part of it, but don't be limited to only leaves. Uh -huh, at least let each one drops, at least one, just one. And if I say at least one, if I say at least one, it doesn't mean one. Yeah, thanks for those adaptations. Let's have a look at these ones. If we consider leaves, the sponge means of your cells are loosely packed. Hmm? You find, you saw the other 3D structure. Hmm? You find one here, another one there, another one here, another one here. Okay? So creating large air spaces. And like we said, <coughs> these air spaces are not just spaces with air. No. They are filled with water. These spaces, this space is filled with water. Okay? And you know how water can easily facilitate the diffusion of these respiratory gases. So you easily allow in. Hmm? You easily facilitate the diffusion of water throughout these cells. So that is brilliant. And then we have still the sponge mesophyll cells covered by a layer of water. Okay? Now these two, they may appear same or similar, but they are kind of different. Oh, they are different. You have loosely packed cells creating large air spaces. Okay? And the large air spaces do facilitate each cell actually has receives enough air okay at any time but now you also fill these air spaces with water so that the cells they are covered by a layer of moist air or a layer of water if we are to be specific and so now it is that layer of water that increases the rate of diffusion so that at any time t the cells who receive enough air. Parasite mesophyll cells, or the cells in the parasite mesophyll layer, are closely packed, tightly packed. And what is that? Like how you say it, you reduce the distance over which these respiratory gases are going to be moved. Then numerous stomata. Yes, leaves have very many, very many stomata. Remember, these are holes, these are channels, okay? Over which the gases will pass both in and out. They do the same way as your nozzle pipes. You know your nose? <laughs> those nozzle pipes, those nostrils, they also allow entry of air and exit of air. So the same applies to these ones. They have numerous. Leaves have very many. And these numerous stomata, they do <coughs> increase the rate of respiration. Differences in thickness of the guard cells. Let's add walls. In the walls of the guard cells, like how we said, you have the inner wall which is thick and inelastic, okay, for both guard cells. And you also have the outer wall, 
which is thin and elastic. So this diff this irregular thickening of the guard cells allows the opening and closure of the stoma. Okay? Which then facilitates the diffusion, the gaseous exchange, the diffusion in and out of these respiratory gases. Okay? In case of any queries, feel free to either unmute and ask or drop it in the chat box. I'll find it. Then, floating leaves, they do lack stomata at lower epidermis. What does that mean? These are leaves that are submerged. Hmm? They, they are in water. This is your water body and you have your leaf. Okay? That is on top of the water body. So you don't need to have stomata down. You don't need to have stomata here. Okay? Because no air is going to enter from here. Because the, the, the lower surface, the lower epidermis is covered with water. And so as a result, you have very many, numerous, very many stomata on the upper epidermis than what you have on the lower epidermis. Okay? So that now you can freely diffuse in and out these respiratory gases. Not so? Yes. <coughs> so, we can consider, uh-huh, leaves of hydrophytes. Now, hydrophytes, these are plants that these are aquatic plants. Hydro comes from water, then fight plant. So they have thin or no chutico. Because now, see here, the challenge is water. You have too much water. Okay? So why do you need chutico? For what? For who? Okay? So you have either thin or no chutico. So that you easily lose water out. Of your body as a plant. Leaves are thin to give to reduce the diffusion distance over which these gases are going to diffuse to reach the cells. Okay? Just imagine if the leaf was this big. Okay? If it was this big and the gases have to diffuse from here and also from here. So how long would it take for gases to reach these cells? Yes, they might have air spaces, but let's make matters worse. And we closely pack these cells. Okay? Then gases wouldn't easily diffuse. So therefore, the leaves being thin, it reduces the diffusion distance over which these respiratory gases are going spread all over the surface yes the broader the leaf the broader the lamina okay and so the broader the lamina the larger the surface area over which diffusion is going to occur from diffusion of gases now let's talk about this we have surface area, okay, and then surface area to volume ratio. These two concepts used to confuse very many students. Should I say me inclusive? I don't know. I don't remember. Now, if I say leaves are broad, are spread to increase the surface area, over which diffusion is going to occur from. And then somebody saying, like, which one can I use? Uh -huh. Somebody saying that unicellular organisms are small, so they have a large surface area to volume ratio. These two points are different. Okay? Having a large surface area is different from having a large surface area to volume ratio. Here we are considering a volume, okay? But now this is just surface 
area the surface over which the children is going to come from so if your diff is like this then you have a large surface gases can enter at this point gases can enter at that point gases can enter at this point and gases can also enter at that point but an organism being small in size that organism has an a small surface area okay compared to a large organism but if you consider surface area to volume the ratio becomes large in small organisms than how the ratio is in large organisms okay so i hope that one is understood so those are the leaves how about roots and stems because we say that they also do carry out each plant structure carries out its own gas exchange and we saw that for the roots and stems they have specialized gas exchange surfaces called denticels and there are those structures where gas exchange is going to take place from so now if you consider cells that make the stem the cells have large air spaces they are not tightly packed as your body cells no yes they are packed tightly but still they still form the air spaces within themselves within them now it is through these air spaces that gases are able to diffuse through the entire stem okay that when if this is maybe your stem or your root and you have your dentin cell here okay you have your dentin cell here if gases enter at this point then these gases will be able to distribute throughout the entire stem with ease not so yes and so increasing the rate the ease of obtaining the respiratory gases to these plants number two the formation of pneumatophores a moment okay, okay. Now, now we have roots which are submerged for instance this is a root and the root is grown in a water a water rugged area a water rugged rugged area now you know that in senior two you studied that you increase the water level, you increase the water content, you increase the water content of the soil, then you reduce air. Now these water logged areas they do have the poor content, okay? The poor water content. Sorry, the poor air content. And so what does that mean? For these plants to survive, then they must form the breathing roots. So there are these breathing roots that emerge outside of that water rugged area. So if this is maybe the ground, okay, and this is your plant, and this is a root, and the root is sub is within the water rugged area. So instead of this root suffocating due to lack of oxygen. Then this root is going to grow these breathing roots that will emerge out of the ground okay that will emerge outside now there are these breathing roots that will take in oxygen and then take out carbon dioxide and then they transport it to the entire root for it to respire okay for it to respire and produces its energy and it survives. So these pneumatophores, they are breathing roots in the plants. Then, possession of short roots, yes, short and close to the ground, where oxygen is in, is plenty. 
okay yes oxygen is dissolved the soil air hmm? or air in the soil is plenty in the, the the soil that is above in the top soil so now for you when you possess these wrong roots that will dig deep 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 in the ground then obtaining oxygen becomes a challenge little or no 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 critical to easily allow diffusion of is respiratory gases then elongate stem to expose the stomata to atmosphere so that the stoma allow entry and exit of respiratory gases so let's talk about how actually these lenty cells are let's talk about gas exchange in roots so i'm sure all of us here have ever seen such a structure you've ever seen a plant with such structures I see this one, these small structures. Now these tiny structures, they are the ones that we call lenticels. So these are structures that do not have the outside impermeable layer that doesn't allow. Now the, you can't convince me that gases will diffuse at this point here, here. But so as so as a result, you form specialized structures over which gases are going to diffuse from and those structures are called lenticels as you can see so this is a lenticel with broken outside layer with very many cells complementary cells with numerous air spaces that connect to other cells inside a stem or <coughs> inside a root so gas exchange in roots the medium of exchange of his course is of course air okay and gases are exchanged between the inside and the outside environment through some specialized structures called lenticels so dissolved oxygen from the soil that fuses through a non subarized coke cells. These ones. They are coke cells, but they do not have the subbering. And so the gases dissolved in the neighboring soil, if it's a root, or neighboring air, this this air, this environment, they will easily diffuse through this specialized the powers okay called identity cell and because of large air spaces numerous air spaces within these cells together with a the cortex then the gases can easily diffuse through these air spaces to each individual cell okay so on reaching through the inside it diffuses through the cell wall and then cell membrane in the living cell and carbon dioxide diffuses out and if carbon dioxide diffuses out then it will dissolve in the moist layer here in this air space and then it make it through it make its way out okay yes role of oxygen in plants number one aerobic respiration and you produce energy and what will be the energy for maintaining the physiology of these plants? The number two, decrease toxicity of compounds. Where, if for instance you absorb the toxic compounds, would be cyanide, could be heavy metals. But these toxic compounds, you as a plant. Then you will oxidize these compounds into neutral forms that have no any toxicity on a plant. And so you are able to survive that. Then support nitrification and methane oxidation. For example, when you come, you know the, the nitrogen cycle where the oxygen, where the nitrogen that is broken by the bacteria 
it is going to convert it is going to be converted so you break this then you form nitrous oxide and then the nitrous <coughs> oxide converted to okay the nitrous oxide converted to nitrites and then the nitrites converted to nitrates and then you the plant you absorb these nitrates so now without oxygen then there is no way how you will obtain the nitrates and so if you can't have the nitrates then if the nitrogen remains as nitrogen then i don't know if you form enough proteins not even enough you cannot form proteins because nitrogen is a constituent of the proteins and you cannot absorb nitrogen as nitrogen and you you think you will be able to break this triple bond okay yes so oxygen plays an important role as far as nitrification is concerned then with the decomposition you know that if for instance plants that live in boggy areas water rugged areas where there is a high high decomposition too much decomposition so you produce the methane and this methane that is produced it can have some can damage the neighboring plants the root sand so the oxygen is going to be used to oxidize this methane into carbon dioxide and water which are neutral compounds as far as the plants are concerned and so they'll be able to survive in their environments then precipitation of metals in the soil the same you know that most of the oxides and metal hydroxides they are insoluble so when you form the oxygen is going to precipitate these metals that would end up damaging for instance these heavy metals instead of absorbing them you know they are absorbed in solution forms so instead of absorbing them then they will combine with oxygen to form metals ox metal oxides and then the metal oxides will dissolve in water to form hydroxides that are now and so on and you don't absorb because they are not in solution form okay yes so so we all know that just like all human or all, all living organisms earthworms too do carry out gas exchange they do need oxygen they do need to get rid of carbon dioxide but <clears throat> the dynamics the gas exchange apparatus in earthworms are different just like how we discussed in our previous lessons okay they are different you don't expect the earthworm to have that complex system as a mammal but also it is complex basing on its complexity okay it is complex basing on its complex so if you study the body of the earthworm if you know the earthworm and if you have ever seen the earthworm you know that it is always moist and by the way it is even restricted to moist areas okay why it's because of the mode of gaseous exchange the mode of obtaining these respiratory gases okay so earthworms do carry out gas exchange by simple diffusion okay through its skin so now in your mind you should be thinking about why why does it carry out gas exchange through the skin okay why is it able to do that and me can't do it i'm sure you cannot do it okay so in other words think about the adaptations of earthworms to gas exchange so number one the skin is always moist okay ever moist 
So if you know the earthworm, you, 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 you know that you can bear witness to this point. Ever moist. So why is it moist? To dissolve these respiratory gases easily. And so when you dissolve the respiratory gases easily, then they, you increase the rate at which these gases are going to diffuse. Otherwise they can't diffuse on a dry skin. So these earthworms, they are moist. Okay? And so they can carry out gas exchange across their skin. Two, they have elongated bodies. Okay? So this elongation of the body increases the surface, eh? the surface area over which gas exchange is going to occur from. You increase the surface area or the surface over which gas exchange is going to occur from. You can have a look at this. You have a dense network of capillaries under the dermis, under the skin. So what is, what are these capillaries doing? You sweep away the gases, the oxygen, and then you bring the carbon dioxide. So that at any time T, you maintain that concentration gradient. Okay? And so on and so on. We discuss the features, we discuss the adaptations of gas respiratory surfaces, gas exchange surfaces. And they are the same. There is nothing unique as far as an earthworm is concerned. So oxygen is used in the moist skin. And when it dissolves, then it diffuses into the capillaries. And if you are to observe its skin, it is thin, just surrounded by one layer of cells, you can see of few layers of cells and the blood capillaries are close to the skin surface as you can see so that the distance over which these gases are going to cross is minimized it's very small okay and so the rate of diffusion is going to be high so when oxygen finally makes its way into the blood capillaries, the blood of the earthworms, then it will combine with hemoglobin, and then it is transported all over the body. So there is a note here that the gas exchange in these earthworms entirely depend on their skin, regardless of being multicellular organisms. Why? Because of the features they possess. Okay? The skin is moist, like how we say. And so why is it moist? Uh -huh, the skin is it has an elongated body. So what is the elongated body for? Mm -hmm. <coughs> not so active. Yes, they are not so active. And so what does that mean? They require this energy demands. There is less energy demand. So the rate of respiration is not so high. Okay? To take in the, those large volumes of air. Okay? Uh huh. You have a dense network of capillaries under the skin, sweep away the oxygen, and it's a small organism. So. It can easily, eh? the surface area to volume ratio, the volume ratio is high, and so the rate of diffusion is high. You have hemoglobin that transports enough air throughout the body. So this question is, by the way, interesting. But let me give you, let me give you an assignment. Eh? The question says, you, you Gandhi. Make some research, make some reading, and then you write your answers. Why some organisms? And if I say some organisms, I mean a diverse range, eh? a diversity of organisms, ranging from simple unicellular organisms 
to simple multicellular organisms to complex if you that's if you, that is if they are complex so write some notes about why some organisms do not require a gas respiratory surface hmm? do not require specialized respiratory apparatus gas exchange apparatus okay yes they do not write notes about why organisms some organisms do not require complex gas exchange apparatus and then you give examples of those organisms so think about the simple ones such as unicellular organisms think about earthworms for example think about the sponges think about nidarians and others why don't they require that complex gas exchange apparatus what's so yes so that is the same concept so water will always flow from a high pressure okay to a low pressure now what does that imply that same concept is what you are going to bring here okay is what you are going to use here for you to draw air from the atmosphere into your body then there must be pressure changes either pressure inside your body is high and pressure outside is low and there are some organisms by the way that do it differently you reach at a certain point and pressure inside their body is higher than the atmospheric pressure but still pre water or air moves against that okay so that's what we call negative pressure or positive pressure and so it is this concept of positive or negative pressure that move these respiratory gases from one region to another region to another region so for instance consider this toad consider that toad it will it uses the positive pressure to take in the air but at some point there is where there is a negative pressure that is generated for instance if this is the atmospheric air like how you can see then for air to move from atmosphere into the buccal cavity then pressure in the atmosphere must be higher than pressure in the buccal cavity so air is going to move okay from atmosphere to the buccal cavity similarly you man for air to move from atmosphere to the surround to, 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 to your body to your lungs pressure in the lungs must be lower than the atmospheric pressure the pressure in the atmosphere likewise likewise for air to move from your lungs to the atmosphere pressure in the lungs must be higher than the atmospheric pressure so that's that concept of positive and negative pressure is highly considered okay is highly considered it is really some good concept so with positive pressure this is where air moves from a region with high pressure to a region with low pressure and it is used in fish fish use that for example fish open their mouth okay and then they swallow water and then after swallowing water then they close their mouth and push the water into the opatula cavity the same as the adult frogs the insects and the mammals we all base on the pressure difference okay between the outside between the source of air and then 
our bodies okay for instance for you to like i told you to push air out then there must be a pressure difference otherwise if you are not able to do that if you are not able to rev to, to move your ribs your rib cage in and out then you feel to create the pressure difference and so air won't be able to move hmm? the same example i've given hmm? i pour i fetched water with a tube and the tube was connected to the tap okay but after my gel can filled up then i removed this tube from the tap and i just let it throw, yeah? it just fell down and after that i saw water moving out and i thought maybe it was just water okay that had remained in the tap but surprisingly when i went to check in my jerry can i found when the jerry can was almost empty there was no pressure that was applied this side there was no sanction pump neither we had any pump this side but the jerry can was almost empty it was spontaneous it occurred on its own okay so why because of the differences in pressure on real i realized that this jerry can was on some raised eh? the side of the jerry can was kind of raised and the side of this this end it was it was wrong and so this one created enough pressure difference okay to move this water from the jerry can and the water poured this side so the, likewise you can also do, do the same actually even when they are pumping water hmm? the national water they use this concept so much the gravitational force so much actually for them they use gravity that is not go there okay but this one is a good illustration so similarly when you are taking in air it is spontaneous you just create pressure differences Hmm? You raise your rib cage. You def you 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 contract your diaphragm, and you increase the volume in the chest cavity, so that pressure inside lowers than the atmospheric pressure. And then, with the ease, air will just draw inside, just as that. You can also illustrate it. Get your two balloons, put them in some container, and then you cover. And then after covering, somewhere down, you should be able to stretch. You pull down. You see balloons inf eh? inflating. Then you release, you pull back inside. You see balloons deflating from nowhere. Okay? Yes. So now with positive pressure... With positive pressure, pressure inside is higher than the atmospheric pressure. Okay? Pressure inside is higher than the atmospheric pressure. So as a result, the gases will be pushed outside. Okay? But with negative pressure, pressure inside is lower than the atmospheric pressure. Okay. For instance, for the case of amphibians, this is where we have negative pressure generated. For the case of amphibians, it will open its it will close its nostrils, for instance. Okay. <coughs> it will close its nostrils, for instance. So it will close its mouth and open its its nostrils. And then air is pushed inside. Okay? Because the flow, we are going to talk about gas exchange in amphibians. The, the lower flow obviously goes down, volume inside increases, pressure decreases, breath atmospheric pressure. And then air is drawn in the buccal cavity. Okay? Now that is positive because air is moving from high. <coughs> 
to row. High pressure to row pressure. But as if that's not enough, actually it is not even enough, it will close its mouth, okay? Together with its nostrils, they will be closed. You have a valve which closes the nostrils. You close them. Now after closing the two, then the flow of the buccal cavity is raised so that the volume in the buccal cavity in, in decreases and the pressure in the buccal cavity increases past the atmospheric pressure. So air will tend to go back to the atmosphere. But because the nostrils here are closed and the mouth is also closed, then air is going to be pushed where? Into the lungs. So this high pressure that is generated, okay, within the buccal cavity, that tends to push air out, but still it doesn't go out. Then air moves against that, is what we refer to as the negative pressure. Is that really okay? Any questions for me? Please feel free to ask. So, after knowing those concepts, the concept that we've just given, now we are free to talk about gas exchange in insects, amphibians, fish, and then we compare the mechanisms, the counter current, the panel <coughs> from, and then we talk about gas exchange in birds and mammals. Yeah, and we call it a day. A not a day, a topic. But for today, we are going to introduce the tracheosystems, the tracheosystem in insects, and then we call it a day. So, like we said, insects do have a tracheal system that is responsible for distributing of these respiratory gases throughout the entire body. Now, I used to think, oh, unlike other animals like mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, for these ones, the insects do not use their blood. They don't use their transport system to distribute these respiratory gases throughout the body. No. And that's why their blood does not have hemoglobin. If you remember in transport, the insect's blood doesn't have hemoglobin. Why? Because it is not used in transport, it's not for transport of respiratory gases, oxygen. So then if blood is not, does not transport oxygen, then how do these insects obtain their oxygen? How do they ensure that tissues get enough oxygen and tissues get rid of carbon dioxide? It is this tracheal system. It is a system of tracheal tubes, okay, that distribute these respiratory gases throughout the entire body of insects. So if you have a look at this, you have a, an opening, and the opening is usually on the abdominal region, yeah? on the on the lateral side, not abdomen, where you have three in the thoracic. Okay, and then you have on each segment you have their spiracles, you have openings, and these openings they are the ones that we refer to as spiracles. Now they are actually these openings that do allow entry and exit of respiratory gases in insects. <coughs> it cannot. Gas exchange doesn't take place across the entire skin, eh? across the entire body. Why? You should be knowing that. The insect's body is covered by a cuticle. In fact, a waxy cuticle. That 
that is impermeable to not only water but also the respiratory gases. So there is no way how the gases will just diffuse across the entire body. And so as a result, you must have some specific sites on the insect's body where gaseous exchange, where exchange of gases is going to take place from. You need an opening that is going to regulate the entry and exit of these gases. And so that opening is a spiracle. So viewed from the surface, you see an opening with some valve that is responsible for opening and closure of that spiracle. But now that opening opens into a trachea, which terminates into a system of very many tubes. Okay? Very many tubes called tracheos that do distribute these gases directly to the tissues. Okay? Directly to the tissues. And then they obtain the carbon dioxide from the tissues and then they take away the carbon dioxide outside the body. Maybe I want you to, to have a look at this. Just a moment. So, this is our insect. Are you seeing? So, the yellow represents oxygen. You can see. And then the red represents carbon dioxide. So, these <coughs> spiracles on the thorax, they open into this very many system of tubes connected to air sacs, you can see. And then air enters and distributes throughout the entire body. You can see. <coughs> you can see. And then after carbon dioxide comes back from the tissues. Okay? And then all of it collects into these abdominal spiracles. And then they are taken outside and then. So there is no blood vessels involved. No blood vessels involved. Unlike for the birds, now this is this is birds. This is a bird. Okay. You can see exchange through its lung. It's a system of tubes. The lung is divided into it's tube like called parabronca you can see so gases just enter okay and then exchange it and then carbon dioxide is taken outside okay we are going to study the gas exchange in birds where you see first inhalation, second inhalation, and stuff like that. Then you can look at yourself. This is you. Okay? So you take in, the yellow is oxygen, take in oxygen, and then you receive and you. But for insects, you can see blood vessels involved. For birds, blood, blood vessels involved. But now for insects, no blood vessel is involved. It is simply the tracheal system that is responsible for distributing these respiratory gases throughout the entire tissue, the entire body. So this, this is where it terminates to other tissue. So now what happens? Before what happens? Can you describe the tracheal system? In so the insects do obtain their respiratory gases through the system of tubes known as the tracheal system. So it is a network of air tubes that branch throughout the entire body of an insect. And it, they are these tubes that distribute the respiratory gases throughout. The largest, this one, it is called a tracheal. It is trachea, 
you also have a track here and it opens into an opening outside known as a spiracle okay and then interior or inside it extend it extends into fine branches very many branches of tubes known as tracheoles and these tubes they do have now since they are connected directly to the tissues you can have a look you can have a look you can have a look so inside these tubes you have there let me say tissue fluid okay tissue fluid that increases and decreases depending on how the gases are transported at a particular time as we are going to see so now there are gases that are allowed in when the gas is allowed in for instance oxygen to go in the trachea and then tracheals this system of tubes very many of them and now within these tubes you have their fluid so the gases will resolve in that fluid okay and then transported either to the tissues or transported from the tissues so that fluid plays an important role okay as far as gas exchange is concerned then larger insects <laughs> ventilate their tracheal system within the rhythmic body movements so as an insect is busy flapping its wings muscles do contract and relax the abdominal muscles play an important role as far as ventilation is concerned so muscles contract and relax so as they are contracting then the pressure and volume change and now they are the pressure stroke volume changes within the insect's body that facilitates okay the movement in and out the opening of the spiracle to either take in the respiratory gases or take out the respiratory gases so basically that is the insect is gas exchange apparatus so in our next lesson we shall see how actually these gases do carry out gas exchange so in case of any queries please you can 